altar. Uh, these are my disclosures. So, consultant to two of the organizations who are involved in this event. Uh, just on the lighter side, uh, you know, abdominal pain is a real problem. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think we're still trying to plug away in terms of trying to understand it better and treat it better. But, uh, you know, I think this is just to lighten the mood a little bit for this afternoon. Um, so really, the, the first question is, how do pain and nociception differ? Uh, they are actually two different things. Pain, at the end of the day, is a subjective, unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Nociception is a response of the sensory nervous system to harmful or potentially harmful stimuli. And I think the most important point here is due to the subjective nature and emotional aspects of pain, it will never be a biomarker for pain, but it will more likely be one for nociceptive activation. So it's very important to keep in mind, pain is different than nociception. People use them very similarly in the literature sometimes, and we think of them similarly sometimes in clinical practice, but they are in fact two different things. So really, nociception is what underlies our, the transmission in our understanding and awareness of pain but pain itself is very, very subjective and emotional. So what is chronic abdominal pain? So this is intermittent or continuous abdominal pain that is of variable duration. Some studies define it as little as two months. Most studies probably define it more on the li lines of being greater than three months or greater than six months. Uh, and remember that it can be composed of both organic, that is a structural problem that's resulting in pain, or a functional etiology where we don't actually know what's causing the pain. So I think it's also important to remember that at the end of the day, pain is a complex interplay between psychosocial and somatic disease that leads to reduced pain thresholds in the development of chronic abdominal pain. And this is a very busy slide, but I think what I'm trying to show here is that inevitably in almost everybody you meet who has chronic abdominal pain, you have an interplay of all of these factors going on that actually leads to that pain persisting and lasting over a long period of time. So what do I mean by that? So you might have somebody who was totally fine one day and then they got into a car accident, started having bad back problems. On top of that, two years later, they're diagnosed with diabetes and maybe a year after that, they're on insulin, they have poorly controlled blood sugars. After that, they get divorced or they've got a problem at home, right? So creating a psychosocial stress. So all of these things effectively drive your pain threshold down over time. So I think it's very important. So you know, we like to think of diseases leading to pain. And that's, you know, that's true partially, but there are so many other factors at play that join into the picture that ultimately lead to a chronic pain state. So I, I think that's really what the take home is in this slide and an important to understand for all of those uh, individuals who are involved in treating and evaluating patients with chronic pain. So chronic abdominal pain at the end of the day, when you really think about it, it's actually it's a, sort of a tough, it's a tough talk to give on chronic abdominal pain, but when you really dissect it out, there's only really a couple of things that truly lead to chronic abdominal pain. So some are the visceral etiologies, some are what we would call abdominal wall problems, and last but not least are the central disorders, right? So these are the ones that are sort of stemming because of some etiology at the level of the, of the, of the brain. So when we talk about visceral etiologies, there are the functional abdominal pain disorders, so this would include things like functional dyspepsia or, or what we all commonly also think of uh, a little bit differently would be irritable bowel syndrome, right? So those constitute functional disorders. We know chronic pancreatitis can cause chronic abdominal pain, but so can inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulitis if it's recurring and it keeps occurring over a long period of time, and then of course on, on more rare occasions in, uh, infectious and ischemic uh, colitis. Abdominal wall includes patients who've had surgery, those who've had herpes before, or maybe a recurrence of shingles, or maybe it's happened a couple of times, and then those pa patients who have myofascial disorders of the abdominal wall. And then when we start to think about on a central level, we think about depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, and catastrophizing. So and in many pa patients, you might have all three. You might have something in each of those categories that's leading to a chronic abdominal pain state. So uh, you know, there's only really four things that I'm gonna talk about in this talk, and they're gonna be my bullet points and also my take-home points. And this is the first one. Chronic pancreatitis is very rare compared to functional gastrointestinal disorders. However, both cause chronic abdominal pain. So if you look at population-based studies of functional disorders in chronic pancreatitis, uh, you know, recent studies have suggested that functional gastrointestinal disorders are found in about 10 to 13% of the population. 
So if you look, if you assume the U.S. population is about 330 million people, you're looking at about 33 to 44 million people have symptoms that are consistent with a functional gastrointestinal disorder. Now, if you move over to the right side and look at chronic pancreatitis, if you look at the best epidemiologic studies conducted to date, the prevalence is about 3 to 42 out of per 100,000 individuals. So if you look at the United States population, the true prevalence of chronic pancreatitis is about 10,000 to about 140,000. So, I mean, you can see that that pales in comparison to the problems of functional gastrointestinal disorders. So really, the most common cause of chronic abdominal pain in this country and in many Western countries throughout the world is actually a functional gastrointestinal disorder. And when you start to look at children, uh, in fact, you can identify the, the children with chronic abdominal pain. You find that a functional gastrointestinal disorder is at the heart of their pain in about 87% of cases. And this study was you know, almost 10 years old now, uh, conducted in Scandinavia. So what are these functional gastrointestinal disorders? You know, and I'm not going to get a lot into this, but uh, you know, I, I think it's important to think of them as brain-gut interactions. Well, how I describe this to my patients is that you know, the pain could be here in the belly, um, but it could be coming from the brain, or it could be the other way around, right? It could be a pain that started here that's now affecting people kind of mentally and emotionally. So really, there's a, you know, if you want to think of it in terms of highways, north, south highways, think of I-95. You know, there's an I-95 between your, your brain and your gut. It goes in both directions. So pain in one place can impact you in the, di in the other place, and pain in the other place can impact you in the, di in the opposite direction. So it's an important thing to understand. And, you know, there's a lot of effort that has been... Um, sort of, uh, you know, accomplished in the gastroenterology space to define these functional disorders, and that's the whole basis of the Rome 4 criteria. Uh, and of course, this is a pancreas academy, but I think it's going to be very difficult to talk about pain and not talk about functional gastrointestinal disorders because they truly intersect with chronic pancreatitis and other I conditions that cause chronic abdominal pain. So really, uh, the Rome 4 uh, our classification scheme has been developed to categorize and define these disorders. And what's interesting is that this has also largely made its way into the, into the popular press and lay press. There have been at least, uh, you know, I, I've come across about 25 or 26 books written on the brain-gut axis. So it's not like this is out, uh, you know, this is esoteric knowledge. It's available for all of us, you know, whether you're in the scientific field or out in the public. Um, you know, the functional gastrointestinal orders are important. Um, they're prevalent, and they're important for us to understand if we want to take better care of these patients. And also, another, you know, I'm not going to get a lot into therapy, but uh, we also have come to realize over time that probably neuromodulatory drugs, so you know, we're talking about drugs that uh, impact uh, neurotransmission, uh, you know, in, in many cases, uh, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, and other drugs that are used in uh, the psychiatric disease space are actually quite effective for treating these functional gastrointestinal disorders. And on top of that, I, we're also beginning to realize that we might really need to better manage these patients in multidisciplinary contexts where we incorporate the services of, of psychologists as well as psychiatrists to help us take care of these patients. So the second big point will be that early chronic pancreatitis can be difficult to differentiate from functional disorders and other conditions that cause chronic abdominal pain. You know, this was a recent study that came out of Spain. So you know, if you looked at uh, patients with functional dyspepsia and then you started to do studies like endoscopic ultrasound, MRI, or endoscopic pancreatic function testing, you find changes of chronic pancreatitis in almost a fifth of these patients. Now, this is just one report coming out of Spain, a study of approximately 300 patients. But there have been other smaller uh, studies prior to this that have sort of suggested the same findings. So, you know, all the, all the things we use to assess patients for chronic pancreatitis are largely based on these ultrastructural tests, but the, the, but the problem is they're too sensitive. And uh, a lot of folks will have changes that are akin to chronic pancreatitis, but not actually have symptomatic chronic pancreatitis. And this sort of gets at the heart of uh, how, do we, how do we differentiate these disorders in current clinical practice. So if you think about it, uh, you know, what we're used to doing as allopathic physicians uh, is looking for organic GI disorders. So we're very focused on histology, pathology, endoscopy, and radiology. But when you start to think about mo the motility and functional disorders, many of which have very similar symptom profiles to organic diseases, you can see that our tools kind of fall off, right? So a lot of us might be working uh, you know, on the organic GI disorder side, and that's sort of where we constantly focus our evaluations, and that's also a lot of where our treatments come from. But we're not really very good at incorporating you know, studies of motility disorders and functional disorders, partly because we don't have a lot of good studies. But I think it's important to realize just because we don't have a good study, that doesn't mean that everyone's problem is going to fit into an organic one, right? It could still very well be a functional or a motility problem. 
These are some conditions that are other conditions that also mimic uh, and can mimic the pain of chronic pancreatitis. One is chronic abdominal wall pain. Uh, some of you might remember this physical examination sign from medical school or your training. Does anyone know what this is called? <laughs> Carnet sign, that's right. So the Carnet sign is a way to assess whether or not pain could be emanating from the abdominal wall. And what's interesting is not people don't use it much in clinical practice, but uh, you know there is some reasonable literature suggesting that uh, actually it does a fairly decent job of actually differentiating abdominal wall pain from intra-abdominal uh, pain. And uh, this is some literature that now goes back uh, at least almost uh, 20 years now. Um, let's not forget chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, this was a nice review that was uh, conducted um, almost uh, 12 years ago and published in The Lancet. And uh, let's remember that chronic pain is common after surgical procedures. It can occur anywhere from 10 to 50% of patients with severe pain in two to 10%. Um, so, you know, it's not an insignificant number. And certainly, you know, I think we've all seen patients on the med on, in our wards and in the surgical services who've had recurrent operations for whatever reason, uh, you know, for recurrent small bowel obstruction, they've had resections and, uh, you know, they come in and we keep saying their pain is due to adhesions. How do we know it's just not simply due to the fact that we've gone through the abdominal wall several times in order to conduct those resections, and that can certainly damage the nerves and lead to a chronic uh, post-surgical abdominal pain state. Let's also not forget that what had been called irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease is probably also a, a chronic pain state that has come from uh, actual mucosal disease uh, of the colon or some part of the small bowel that even after a resolution can actually continue to cause pain, right, because of its complex circuitry and uh, and involvement of ascending pathways at both the level of the spinal cord and the, and the thalamus of the brain. So this is just a, another example of that. Uh, there's also the centrally mediated disorders of gastrointestinal pain, meaning it's all coming from upstairs. And this is, of course, the most difficult one to sometimes uh, have discussions with about your patients. But these are the patients who might have an underlying psychiatric disorder. And since we don't have a very good you know, mental health care in general in the United States, I think, has been at a little bit of a loss because it's very hard to get patients into psychiatry clinics. And most patients uh, forget that at the end of the day, a lot of depression, for example, it usually presents as a somatic complaint in almost 69% of patients. So that's actually well documented in the literature. So these are those patients. They may have really bad depression. They don't know it, but they're coming in with chronic abdominal pain. And, and the truth is this is actually a centrally mediated disorder of pain. So the next point is that some patients with advanced chronic pancreatitis, now this is looking at the other side of the coin, some patients with advanced chronic pancreatitis have no pain. Uh, in fact, we knew as far back as 1980 that, that even patients with irregular ducts, calcifications, and strictures, um, there's almost an equivalent number of patients with pain uh, and who also don't have pain, right? So you've got, uh, you might have the finding, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's actually causing your pain. And that was shown again in a very large uh, North American pancreatitis study group uh, paper that, in fact, Dr. Wilcox was the first author on. And as you can see here, it's somewhat of a busy slide, but if you look at the top and you look at the pain patterns, everything from going from no pain to E, which is severe constant pain. And on the left-hand side, uh, you have the, all the variables that are constitute findings of advanced chronic pancreatitis. You can see that it's really all over the place. Um, you could have uh, up to 20% of patients, as um, Dr. Evans had reported earlier in a nice study, uh, who don't have any pain, even though they have very advanced morphologic findings of chronic pancreatitis. There is, and this is the, 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 the third and fourth point, uh, the, um, the fourth point, and that is that there is really no easy way to differentiate the visceral and central pain and chronic pancreatitis. So in other words, is pain coming from the pancreas or is it now in the central nervous system? Um, there are some characteristics of visceral pain. So when I mean viscera, uh, visceral pain, I mean I'm talking about pain from organs, right? So sort of internal organs really are what constitute visceral pain. And it's important to remember these sort of five characteristics. One is that not all viscera have sensory innervation. So for example, the liver, lung, and kidney don't have sensory innervation. So you're not really going to feel pain from those organs. Um, it's also important to remember that, uh, that visceral pain is not always due to visceral injury. So distension of the bladder, for example, or obstruction of the bile duct, or ischemia and inflammation of pancreatitis can lead to pain, but if you cut the intestine or you burn the intestine, you don't feel any pain from that. Uh, visceral pain is commonly referred to other locations. It's diffuse and poorly localized, and it can be accompanied by both motor and autonomic reflexes. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So in other words, these patients can not only have pain, but they may also have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, to a variable extent based on patient to patient. 
So it's really the sensory nerves that mediate this nociception. Remember the actual movement of painful impulses uh, between the organs of the intra-abdominal cavity and the central nervous system. And when you start to think about the pancreas, uh, a chronically inflamed and gradually fibrotic pancreas is going to release inflammatory mediators and cytokines that activate this, the, the pancreatic nerves or the pancreatic nociceptive afferents that then uh, synapse at the level of the dorsal root ganglia, and then they come back to the spinal cord, and that makes its way back up through the spinal thalamic tract to the thalamus of the brain. But what you start to find is over time, with that chronic inflammation and fibrosis, you start to develop a pancreatic neuroplasticity that ultimately leads to sensitization uh, of both the peripheral nerves as well as uh, a central sensitization, which then involves the spinal cord and, and the brain. So this, this process happens over time. We just don't know how long it takes in chronic pancreatitis. We don't know if it takes years or it takes a couple of months, but certainly some patients uh, will, uh, will develop this sensitized state, at, at which point even doing uh, really radical interventions like removing the pancreas may not in fact take away the patient's pain. Let's also remember that, of course, all of our interventions in chronic pancreatitis, both from an endoscopic and surgical viewpoint, overall have largely focused on alleviating intraductal pressure because we always felt that that was a primary mechanism of pain in chronic pancreatitis. But we know that that's not really the case. It's probably more the neuropathic changes that really drive the pain of chronic pancreatitis. And this is just a slide illustrating that. So on the left-hand side, you can see that that's a pancreas with a large, uh, a large, pan uh, you know, large dilated duct with irregular side branches. And the thought was is that there must be some degree of obstruction that's leading to increased pressure, uh, and that is really what's causing pain. But we know that over time that it's really more the inflammation of the nerves, uh, as well as an increase in the size and the volume of the nerves of the pancreas that actually are causing this sort of chronic pain state. And, and you can actually see that if you look at patients who've undergone resection for chronic pancreatitis, and you look at patients who've had um, pancreatic resection, resection for non-painful reasons, like let's say removal of a cyst adenoma. And if you look at the adjacent tissue next to the cyst adenoma, you see a normal concentration of nerves within the pancreatic tissue. But if you look at the patient who has chronic pancreatitis, you can see there's a, a marked increase in not only the size, but also the density of the nerves in the pancreas. So this is really what we call pancreatic neuroplasticity. And this occurs with some time, over time, in patients who are developing chronic pancreatitis. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna bury you with this, but uh, in, I think it's important to realize that really there is an, a, a very extensive nerve connections between the pancreas and other abdominal organs and the central nervous system. Um, this is just showing an example of the colon and the stomach, and you can see all the connections back to the level of the spinal cord and the brain. And this is important because this is all the referred pain uh, that you see, uh, not only with pancreatitis, but with other painful intra-abdominal conditions, is due to these nerve connections between the organs and the central nervous system. So if you think about a lot of the conditions that we sort of talk about and we treat you know, as gastrointestinal practitioners, you can see that there are a wide variety of uh, referred pain patterns and distributions in patients. And, there's, uh, and uh, even for the pancreas, we have referred pain patterns. So if you, if you, look, at, um, if you look at the pancreas at the bottom of, of the slide over here, you can see that with time, you're gonna have bombardment of uh, through, the, um, through the peripheral nerves back into the spinal cord, and that actually, that, those painful impulses can be felt really along the T10 dermatome uh, of, of the patient's anterior abdomen. And that's part of the reason why when we assess these patients through physical examination, that's actually what we're touching, right? We're touching the T10, ab, uh, the T10 dermatome uh, because that is a reflection of sort of the pancreatic uh, um, um, pain impulse. Um, so in other words, you're not touching the pancreas when you're touching the belly, right? You're touching the T10 dermatome, but that's where the pancreas sort of uh, uh, manifests its painful impulses. So that's just, uh, just another way to show it. So C5 would be an area that's not affected, but clearly T10 would be. Um, there are other conditions where we have referred pain. I think everyone knows about myocardial infarction, right? So it's not just always left-sided chest pain. Uh, these patients can have pain up into their jaw and, and, the, and into their arm. Uh, this is an example of referred pain. And also the referred pain in appendicitis. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of, uh, this is the pain that starts, um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, it, it starts to become more sharp as it becomes more localized and more inflamed in the region of the cecum and the appendix. So that's yet another way that you sort of ha sometimes see a shifting pattern of pain in patients with appendicitis. So they might come in with more sort of peri-umbilical pain and it'll gradually shift over. 
as the pain become, as the inflammation becomes more severe. Another important point is that uh, the nerves that carry pain also communicate with nerves that are associated with symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, and the reason this is important is because, uh, you know, patients will come in with pain, but they'll also say, I have terrible nausea, or I've got diarrhea, or I'm vomiting all the time. And we're like, well, wait a minute, but those things sort of make me think of different disorders other than the pancreas. But the truth is, is that uh, this is the reason why patients not only with chronic pain will often have other symptoms, and no two patients are the same. So unfortunately, we don't really have a classic pattern of pain and associated symptoms, um, even though we like to think of it this way because we want to put patients in discrete boxes. But I think it's very difficult to do in clinical practice, partly because of this mechanism. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, central sensitization over time, but really what we're talking about there is, uh, is a bombardment of those primary nociceptive afferents, that synapse in the spinal cord, and then make their way up to the thalamus of the brain. And what happens over time is you have those constant nerve impulses coming back in, and that leads to something called both hy hyperalgesia and allodynia. And if that was to be described in sort of a, in another way, um, hyperalgesia, uh, I mean, if I had to describe it simply, um, is eliciting pain, you know, something that normally causes pain and is now causing even greater pain in somebody who has hyperalgesia, right? So, so if I take your hand and, and, and I pinch it, almost everybody would be like, ouch, that hurts. But in somebody who has hyperalgesia, just even slightly pinching will actually cause an exaggerated pain response. Whereas allodynia is something that doesn't cause pain, actually causes pain. So if you use a, a feather, if you just kind of rub it up against somebody's hand, uh, it should normally not cause pain, right? But in somebody who has allodynia, that actually might be a painful, uh, a stimulus that provokes a, a painful response. So just to quickly go over my key points, uh, chronic pancreatitis is rare compared to functional disorders. And however, both cause chronic abdominal pain. Early chronic pancreatitis can be difficult to differentiate from functional disorders and other conditions that cause chronic abdominal pain. Some patients with advanced chronic pancreatitis will have no pain over their lifetime, actually, in many instances. And there is no real easy way at the present time to differentiate the visceral and it, visceral pain of the pancreas versus the central pain that might occur over time. Thank you very much.